repentance, what it means and the where we get the word and uh, and maybe cut through some of the ambiguity that's uh, uh, surrounded by this word, mainly due to religion. They have their way of, of taking the word penance and adding it to repent, and that's not where it's at. So we'll take a look at uh, how religion views it, and then we'll we'll uh, do what we do and and uh, look at the scriptures. So instead of the traditions of men. So the Roman Catholic viewpoint is, like I said, penance. Uh, it's it's not a according to my Catholic uh, friend here, or prior, <laughs> gave me some, some tips because I don't know beans about it, but uh, it's not a thing you do yourself, uh, the Roman Catholic Church way, is to present yourself, so you have somewhere to go, you have to, and then you have uh, something to do. You have to uh, present yourself to the priest, confess your sins, follow these instructions for, for his instructions for his forgiveness, and it's a really a mixture of Judaism and um, Catholicism. So then there's the, for those who don't get too far away from Rome, there's the Protestant viewpoint. And that is a do-it-yourself kind of thing where you don't, you don't go to a priest. You can uh, say a prayer on your own. Uh, but the, the, what both of these have in common is sorrow for sin. And repent doesn't mean that. It just means to change your mind. So that's the, the Bible believer's viewpoint is change of mind, a change, change your mind to change your thinking, and which changes your behavior. Uh, it's the root cause of one's behavior. Change your mind causes a change of behavior, not, not sorrow for sin, because the, re the reason why we can stand up here and say repent has nothing to do with sorrow for sin is because God repents many times in the, in the word. So it's like an oxymoron, right? So, and I thought when I started uh, getting into this, I would look to Martin Luther because he came from the Catholic Church. What did, what did he say, right? So I'll read you this excerpt that I had from a book that I got offline. It says, Martin Luther charged that penance provided no lasting assurance of forgiveness, something he thought could only be found in justification by faith. He came to see penance as a source of troubled consciences, works, righteousness, and clerical tyranny. That he hit it on the head, I think. Mm -hmm. So what saith the scripture? So I picked out about five verses from the Bible that pretty much put it to rest that repent is is a change of mind and not sorrow for sin. So um, we looked at, um, let's turn with me to Genesis 6. Genesis chapter 6. Now this is the first time the word is is found in the Bible. So uh, this is going to uh, establish from here on throughout wherever you're at in the Bible when you see repent. It doesn't mean sorrow for sin. It means you follow the context, you'll see this, there's a change of mind that's going on. So uh, verse 5 and 6, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of his thoughts of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So if we take the religious viewpoint of the word repent and apply it to this verse, the question is, is God repenting for his sin? And I, I wouldn't want to be the one who thinks that, but God doesn't sin. So therefore... That's not what's going on. God had a plan for man, and through man's rebellion, and through, with the sin nature he got in chapter 3, 
God had to change the plan. He changed his mind about what he's got in store for man. And, he, of course, this is pre-flood here, just before the flood, then he floods the earth. So that's, that's uh, not, uh, not sorrow for sins. And then um, let's look at um, Exodus chapter 13. Get Exodus 13. And Exodus 32. Exodus 13, verse 17. Now, uh, this is talking about when the Israel was leaving Egypt. And uh, verse 17, he says, And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. Uh, the peop uh, he says, And God said, Lest preadventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. So if it's a changing of mind, you, you, that makes sense right there. He didn't, he didn't want them to change their mind about leaving Egypt and, and return to Egypt. So there's no, again, no sorrow for sin there. Um, it's just a changing of your mind, changing your behavior. Um, Exodus 32. Exodus 32. Start in verse, this is when um, God and Mo Moses on, on top of mountain, Mount Sinai with God, and he's given them, the, he's up there for 40 days, he's given them the law and the commandments, and uh, the Lord says in chapter, uh, verse 7 there in Exodus 32, and the Lord said to Moses, go get thee down thy peep for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. So they've, they've gone back to the thinking that when they had when they were in Egypt, they saw what pagan religion was all about. They say, we're, they're we're tired of waiting on Moses, so let's do what we know. Uh, verse 9, And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now for let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make thee a great nation. Interesting, he says that to Moses, I'll make thee a great nation, but he told that to Abraham, I'll make you through your seed. And Moses, his parents were Levites, so he's in the line of, of he could actually do that. He could destroy these people and start over with you, Moses, but Moses talks him out of it. Um, in uh, verse 12 there, down at the bottom there, it says, turn, he tells the Lord, turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Change your mind about destroying them. And uh, because of what the Egyptians might think, they think you, you, pulled the, you, you lured these people out of Egypt so you, you could destroy them. Or, you, know, you could have just left them here and we could have destroyed them. But, but uh, nevertheless, verse 14, after Moses had pleaded his case, and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. He changed his mind about destroying those people. Um, Jeremiah 15. Let's look at Jeremiah 15. I just wanted to lay the groundwork for what the word really means because if you're coming out of religion that's uh, you, you need you need some some solid scriptures to base this on um, the context it's, uh, it's Jeremiah 15 but the context really starts in 13 when uh, chapter 13 verse 10 he says, the, this evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods, 
small g, meaning pagan gods, to serve them and to worship them shall even be this girdle, which is good for nothing. So they're, they're back. here we go with idolatry again. And so you move up to, what did I say, 15. Uh, verse 6. Thou hast forsaken me, talking about the nation of Israel, saith the Lord, thou art gone back, Word, meaning in your thinking, you've gone backward to how you thought when you were in Egypt. Therefore, I will stretch out my hand against thee and destroy thee. I am weary with repenting. I'm tired of changing my mind. They, they go off, they go astray. He, you know, over, over time, the course of the time, they're always threatening. I'm going to punish you. And, and, then, and then he gives them a break, punish you, give them a break. This time, He's not going to give him a break. And he says, I'm weary with repenting. He's changing his, he's tired of changing his mind. That's how often God repents. So if God's repenting, we know it has nothing to do with sorrow for sin. And then Jonah chapter 3. Jonah, book of Jonah, chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3, uh, verses uh, 9 and 10. Uh, so, again, the city of Nineveh, the, the Gentile nation, but the, they're, under, they're, they're in idolatry as well. And uh, God tells Jonah, Ar arise and go into Nineveh, that great city. And this is verse 2. That great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went, and he did exactly what God told him to do. And uh, verse 4 there, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God. And Nineveh is a very pagan city. It's the capital city of Assyria. So... For them to just change their mind from idolatry and believe God is a, quite a feat. Down there in chapter 4, he, he tells them that there's a six score thousand people. There's 120,000 people down there, and they all believe, well, according to the verse, they believe God. And so that's, that's what we're talking about. They change their mind from idolatry and believe God, from darkness to light. Uh, it, and then you go down to verse 9. Th this is the, the uh, king of Nineveh talking here. He says, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce angle that we perish not? So he's saying, who can tell? Maybe if we stop worshiping idols, God will repent and change his mind about destroying us. And uh, Verse 10, and God saw their works, that they turned from the evil way, and God repented of the evil, which he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So he, he, they, he changed his mind and didn't destroy them. It's interesting, though, in um, Matthew chapter 12, flip up to Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is referring to this, this, this event right here about... Jonah's preaching to the to the nation of, of Nineveh. Um, verse forty one, Matthew twelve forty one. He says, uh, "The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation." Uh, all I'm after here is repent. Okay, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So there's some typology going on here, but my, when you read back there in Jonah chapter 3, he, he, uh, he says they repented at the preaching of Jonah. So that's 3. He says, Arise, go into Nineveh, in verse 2, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. And that's what he preached. And they changed. So 
They, they don't use, the, the scripture doesn't say repenting, but that's what they did. They changed their mind from pagan idols to God, and Jesus refers to it as they repented at the preaching of Jonah. So there you go. So um, from here, it go, I don't know, it doesn't matter how far I get because the word means the same thing throughout the Bible. It's not one of those words that has many different meanings like, say, let or something like that. Repent means change your mind from Genesis 6 all the way through, even, even through Paul's preaching. Paul preaches repentance, but not how religion preaches it. It has nothing to do with sorrow for sin. So when you, now it gets interesting or, or, and is when you understand that word and you, get, and you start going into the four Gospels. Because John the Baptist preached the baptism of repentance. So, again, changing of mind, right? Now, the, the, the things to be remi- to remember when you're reading the four Gospels is n- not, they're under the law of Moses, which doesn't have a bearing on the word, but it, the context it can. Um, Israel had a completed Hebrew Bible that was there for them. It wasn't locked up in the temple. It was it was it been copied out for lo- a long time. It's all over the place, and they have a copy of the Hebrew Bible that is either going to be a um, a witness for them or against them because he's going to refer to that don't you know have you not read okay so um, Roman in Romans chapter 3 verse 1 it talks about what is the advantage what, the, what advantage hath the Jew Romans 3 1 and get uh Romans 15, 8 as well. Romans 3, 1. What advantage hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. They have the word of God. Um, And in Romans 15, 8. Now I say, this is Paul in uh, Romans 15, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. So when you're in the four Gospels, Jesus Christ is a minister to the nation of Israel, the circumcision under the law. So we're not talking church, the body of Christ here, but the word is used here a lot, uh, repentance, and again, it's, uh, it just helps to know what it means when you go through the four Gospels. Uh, they have a coming Redeemer that they're aware of. Um, they have, if they have a com- coming Redeemer and a King, then, you, then that goes along with they have a coming King uh, Kingdom. And Daniel, and that'll be uh, turn to Daniel two forty four. Daniel two forty four. I got my bookmarks because I'm so slow. Daniel 2, verse 44. This is the uh, the goal of all of prophecy is right here in Daniel 2, 44. So they they have this in their book, and they, are, they, they should be aware of this kingdom and their king. In, in verse 44, And the days of these kings shall God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left unto other people, but it shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So they have a king kingdom coming, and and uh, that's in their Bible. So they should they should know that. Uh, they also have a time schedule in Daniel chapter nine. Daniel chapter nine. I'm not going to go through the math on this, but. This is verse 24, Daniel 9, 24. This is the timing of why, why the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are where they are in the Bible because of this time schedule right here. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity to bring in the everlasting righteousness. 
and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy, capital H there, is Christ. So that, that 70, 70 weeks of years is 70 times 7, 490. And, and, and when it's not, when you get in the four Gospels, it's not, and we're not in the 70th week, we're in the, about the 69th week. So it's at hand. That's what he's talking about in the Gospels. And John the Baptist preaches that. Then speaking of John the Baptist, he's the uh, forerunner. This is another way um, Israel was to be able to identify their coming Messiah. Was You're going to see John the Baptist, uh, the, uh, which is spoken, he's spoken of in uh, Isaiah 40 and Malachi 3. So when you, when you see John the Baptist, the one crying in the wilderness, then you know you should know right after him he's going to be your Messiah. You need to be able to identify uh, your Messiah, and um, I think uh, Acts chapter nineteen is a good illustration of that because he's he's to prepare the way. When you prepare, you got to come before somebody, and that's what he's doing. John the Baptist is, um, but. Acts chapter 19, verse 4. Then said Paul, John, that's John the Baptist, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. So there's a timing thing there. You want you to see John the Baptist, you should be expecting to see your king. So it's more identification. Um, so... Turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I'm just going to, I'm not a good artist, but I heard that. So, I'm not going to draw a globe. There's seven continents. Seven. And this is Israel. Because he says in John chapter 1, uh, verse 10 and 11, he came into the world... He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. That would be, it would be everybody, right? This is the world. These are all the countries that make up the, 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 the nations on the earth. All the people are in, and this would be the Asian continent. Israel is uh, located on the Asian continent. Because he says in verse, in verse 12, he came into his own, and his own received him not. The world knew him not. But Israel received them not. So this isn't supposed to be because circumcision was supposed to separate the Jew from the Gentile in everything. And they, what they have in common with the rest of the world is unbelief. So they have a, uh, there's a problem there. And, and now Israel has the book. They, they know they should know. That he's coming, but and and a lot of them do, but they don't know when. Now he said when it says the world and his his own received not that's by and large true, because in verse twelve he says, but as many as received them to them he gave them power to be sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. There are some people, even though it says you know the world knew him not, his own received him not. That's by and large. Because there's what he goes on to refer to the believers as little flock. Vast majority don't, but there's enough that he refers to them as the little flock. Um, look at uh, John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 22. 
And Jesus is talking to the um, Samaritan woman here. He says, you, and the Samaritans are, again, here we go with the idolatry, right? The whole world, when, when, after Genesis chapter 11, God gave up, Paul tells us in Romans 1, that he gave them up to go their way. What they do is, is idolatry. And so that's why it's so prevalent. Um, and so in John chapter, chapter 4, verse 22, you worship, you know not what. You, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. You don't even know what it, that thing is you're worshiping. It's just, you know. I always think of the Philistines. They, they worship golden mice. Anyway, verse 25, the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. She knows something. Again, they have a, they have a Bible. It's not she's, she, she's aware of it. And, and then so when Jesus says unto her, in verse 26, I that speak unto thee am he. She didn't know it was, it was him, but she knows, I know he's coming, but I just don't know when. And he says, it's me. And, and she goes and to, leaves him and runs to her, to her people and says in verse 29, come, see a man which told me all things I, I ever did, that ever I did, is not this the Christ, Con, uh, question mark. They're expecting the Messiah, right? She, she knows it and says, this has got to be him. So it's identification of the Messiah is, is, a, is a lot of what's going on in, in the Gospels. Um, yeah, so. All right, so now uh, continuing on with the, the, those that did believe. Um, that's something I wanted to point out is because the, the, if people are going to repent, change their mind, they're going to do it based on some doctrine. It's not emotional-based zeal. It's, it's doctrinal changing of mind. And uh, John, uh, look at John 1, 45. John 1, 45. Okay. Now, this is, this is using your Bible as designed here. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So he's, he's acknowledging the Messiah based on Scripture. And um, he's, a, he's aware of his coming. Um, let's see, John chapter, no, let's go to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 14. John seven fourteen. now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. He's teaching. This is the, the author of your Bible teaching you. You know, I didn't even think about that. It's crazy. And he, you know, so, and, and the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters have we not learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. My doctrine. Okay, so he's teaching some doctrine. He's not, okay. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. So if someone's going to change their mind, they're going to know something about the Word of God, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. And in verse 19, he says, Did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keep it? Why do you go about to kill me? And 14 through 18. He that speaketh, I'm sorry, go back to verse 18. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. That would be someone who's teaching something without any doctrine to base it on. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true and no unrighteousness in him. Okay, so then uh, look, look at uh, John chapter 5. I just wanted to see that if anyone's going to recognize the Messiah, it's going to be based on the doctrine. Not willy-nilly or emotional. 
Uh, okay, so John 5, verse 45. Jesus validates Moses' writings here. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. Um, 46, for had you believed Moses. Now, Moses is nowhere near around right here. He's been dead a long time. So he's referring to the, the Hebrew Bible the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. The book of Moses, wrote, Moses wrote the first five books. He was referring to them to, for had you believed Moses, you would believe me, the writings. For he wrote of me, he says right there. So, so the question is, Deuteronomy 18, what, what did Moses write? If you go back to Deuteronomy, that he, verse 18, what is he referring to? Deuteronomy 18, where did I put it, uh, verse 15, we'll do 15 and verse 18, Deuteronomy 15, the Lord thy God will raise up thee a prophet, notice that is capitalized, he's talking about this time over here in the, in the, in the Gospels. From the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. So, there's your prophecy. There's, there's what Moses wrote. You're, I'm going to send you a prophet, and you're going to have to use the scriptures to identify him. And um, verse uh, 18, again. I will raise him up a prophet from among the brethren, like unto thee. I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak unto them all that I command him. Okay, so that's Christ right here in the Gospels. He's that prophet, and he's in the midst of them. And how are you going to identify him is with the word of God. John the Baptist is a big help in that, in, in your recognition. Um, and then, okay, so we just read Deuteronomy 18 there. Now flip over to John 7. So you got, they have doctrine saying, okay, we have a, a prophet coming, capital P, a prophet, a capital P prophet, that's Christ. Verse 40, uh, many of the people, therefore, when they heard this, this no, I'll go back up to 39, um, or 38, actually, John 7, 38, he that believeth on me as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. I'll drop down to verse 40. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Capital P, prophet. So they're basing their understanding of who Christ is. This is the guy. This is the man, the, the Christ that we were looking for in prophecy. So, again, changing their mind from about the time. It's that time. Um, so you, then, um, John chapter seven, verse 41, verse there, yeah, right down. So now there's those, these people believed, so you said, this, this is the prophet. Others said, I should have just con continued reading, this is the Christ, but some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? He hath not the script hath not the scripture said that Christ has come of the seed of David, out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was. So it says in verse 43, there was a division among the people because of him. So the circumcision are one nation, but within that nation there's a division when Christ comes. Is he the Messiah or isn't he? And the people who do believe are doing it correctly. They're believing Scripture. So um, that's, how the, that's, that's how it's supposed to be. So the division the, for the people that believe, circumcision isn't going to get it anymore. 
because how am I going to how are how are you how are you going to identify yourself as a believer when your fellow circumcision or the vast majority of them don't believe you? So what do you need? You need a new identity, which is what water baptism is going to do. Water baptism will will identify the believe the repented the change of mind or understanding of the time. The, the, that's the believer. So the believer believes the prophetic doctrine. So what does John the Baptist tell them? So we'll flip over to Matthew chapter 2. No, I'm sorry, Matthew 3. Matthew 3. Matthew 3, verse 2. I'll look at verse 1. <clears throat> Matthew 3, 1. In those days came John the Baptist, which was that forerunner for Christ, preaching the wild in the wilderness and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent ye. If you, if, if you look at that right there in that context, you think, okay, sorrow for sin. That's kind of, that's just kind of, uh, what do you call that? Random, right? He just comes out, repent. For what? Right? But if you understand it, it's change your mind. The, and then the issue is you need to know it, it, it's that time. So they're ignorant of the prophetic time in Daniel chapter 9 that we looked at. Um, and an, uh, another verse that go, that's good with this is uh, Matthew 16. Matthew, I'm sorry. Um, Luke 12, Luke 12, Luke 12, 53. Um, the, oh, shoot, that's the division. I wanted to uh, show you the, the people that, that they're divided, right? So, um, He says, uh, I'm come, where is the, uh, the 16, here, 54, I thought. Okay, so Christ is talking, uh, verse 54, and, and he said it, uh, unto the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway you say, there cometh a shower. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be a heat, and it come to pass. You hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and and of the earth, but how is it that you did not discern the time? That's what we're talking about, the time. It's time for your Messiah to show up, and, you're, and, and you can predict the weather based on what you see, but you, can't, you should be able to know that, that this is the time of your Messiah to be here. That's the idea there. So... Um, so repent ye, but ye is again an important word there because the, it's a plural you, as we know, meaning the nation, the whole nation, all of the circumcision. For what? They're ignorant of the prophetic time in Daniel 9, 24, and, and we were just writing Luke. So in Matthew 3, Matthew 3, verse 11, He says, he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. You changed your mind about the time. You understand what time it is. You under, if you understand what time it is, then, you'd, then you would believe John the Baptist. And if you believe John the Baptist, when he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes it away the sin of the world, then you would believe all that together. Because you've changed your mind, um, we have, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. So water baptism accomplish that for their identity um, because you uh, so in other words they change their mind they change the behavior from not knowing to knowing and identifying the time John the Baptist is true Jesus Christ is the Messiah son of God that's true that and you see all that therefore get water baptized for identification purposes that's what it was it's 
it, it was necessary in this in this time. So, because you know, a lot of people now uh, we're an age of grace. People say, "Well, water baptism doesn't save you," but it it's an outward expression of your. And it, Water baptism definitely saved you over here. This is definitely necessary. Matthew 16, 16, he says, he who is baptized shall be saved, and he who is not shall be damned. So, I mean, I don't see how you, you got you to gotta understand where this is, this is definitely necessary here. Okay, so that division, again, uh, between the believer and the unbeliever, is, is real, so that's the reason for the, the identification. Now, so again, you can see it has nothing to do with sorrow for sin. It's it's scriptural based knowledge that makes you change your mind. You change your mind. You change your thinking. If you have poor behavior, then you change your mind, and which produces the poor behavior, right? So that's the idea. And, and uh, now we'll, we can look at um, repenting in the uh, book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Um, verses 1 through 4, we'll start at... This is what John the Baptist said and, and uh, what's going on here. This is the day of Pentecost, when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Jo this is what John said in chapter 11. He said, I indeed baptize you with water. The one that's coming after me, after me, the, okay, John the Baptist first, and Christ comes after me. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And that's what's happening here. Um, the f in verse, verses 1 through 4. Verse 13 Acts 2.13, and, and then these people are there, and they're seeing, the, and they're, they're um, wondering what's going on. Well, these, these people are speaking in different languages, in different, uh, the different tongues, which are languages, and they're, they're, and they're mocking. So they're saying, these men are full of new wine. And uh, so I guess new wine has more punch to it or something. Verse 16, according to the prophet Joel, so he's, Peter's going to say this, accord, here we go with doctrine again. These are the days prophesied by the, doc, by the prophet Joel. And he, you've seen this. You've seen the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You witnessed it. And then, um, uh, let's see, verse 16. It shall come to pass in the last days, and they think they're in the last days here, saith to God, I will pour out my spirit upon all the flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And that's what they witnessed. So you go down to verse um, 22. He says, you men of Israel, calling out, calling out his men, you know, making a distinction of who he's speaking to. You men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him ye delivered to the de by the determinate counsel of foreknowledge of God have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain him. So he's indicting them for killing the Messiah. And these men thought he wasn't the Messiah. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. But he's using this prophecy to see this is already foretold and you killed him. And so, uh, verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They understand something. Bing, we killed the Messiah. So he says what? Repent, change your mind, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the, for the remission of sins. So they're going to change their mind from believing that he wasn't the Messiah to, based on doctrine, believing that he was the Messiah. So that's, that's just as simple as that. So that, that's what we're talking about, changing of the mind. 
and if you look at that through religion, that isn't going to work. That, does, that doesn't make any sense. Have sorrow for sin because you didn't change your mind. I, I think of my brother. I, I grew up with two brothers, and we would get after each other. Somebody would cry. My mom would say, say you're sorry, and you'd say, I'll say sorry. But we both, we all knew, given the same circumstances, we're going to do it again. You know, that's, but that's not, that's not repenting. You've got to change your mind. So uh, you change your mind, you change your behavior. Okay, so so he says, repent, change their minds about Jesus Christ not being the Messiah. Be water baptized for a new identity for the remission of sins. Acts 17. You know, Paul goes out into the Gentile world, which is everywhere you go, they have their own version of their own gods. And in Acts 17, he's in Athens, Greece. So we all know what, I mean, you can get a degree in myth, Greek mythology. You know, that's something, huh? A, a degree in fiction. I, sh I probably should have tried it. That sounds like an easy course. Uh, verse 16, yeah, like, uh, they're in idolatry. Uh, Acts 17, 16, where are they at here? Paul, now, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the, whole, the city wholly given to idolatry. The, okay? Bad thinking. And verse 29, for as much then as we are, the, he's telling his people, the, these idolaters, for, for then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to, now notice he says, think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's devices. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at, back in Genesis 11, but now commandeth everywhere to repent. We shouldn't think that God is a, an idol. Repent, change your mind to believe that he's, here, here, you, you, here's your God and, and here's your scriptures. So, Verse 30, oh, well, I just read it, yeah. That's what the, re so again, change your mind, change your behavior, bad behavior. But he's nowhere saying, get down on your knees and pray for forgiveness and all that. Change your mind, then, then you will change your behavior. Uh, so uh, again, Paul preaches repentance, um, but, so, but he doesn't do it religiously with, you know, go, go see the priest or, or say a prayer. Isn't it interesting is you'll see people, I said it, the, the sinner's prayer. You're going to base your eternity on a prayer that's not in the Bible. You know what I mean? That, 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 I, wow, just like, shh. But Acts 20, verse 21, again, Idolatry, idolatry. Uh, he's talking to both to the uh, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. So, if you're having to repent towards God, where were you thinking? It wasn't towards God, yes, because that's what repentance says. Change your mind from what idols toward God. And faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, change your mind toward God and Jesus Christ because it's it's not their it's it's not their faith. Their their faith was toward idolatry. That's what that's what it's saying. And then um, First Thessalonians chapter one is is a lot along the same lines. First Thessalonians chapter one. Verse eight. First Thessalonians one eight, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word. That's what he was just saying, toward God, your faith toward God, not idols. 
so in verse 9, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned to God from idols. That's repenting. Okay, so now, I've got five minutes left here. Does the body of Christ repent? I'm gonna, it has to be kind of quick here. Um, we, we do it scripturally. When Paul, we look at Colossians 3. Colossians 3. We, we're, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you're saved. You, you understand you're a, you're a sinner. You need, you need a Savior. And Christ died on the cross for your sins. And that's, you don't add anything to that. These, these religious ways of repenting is adding to the cross. It's, I, the most famous preacher on, ever on TV, first you got to repent and then trust Christ. That's, that's, that is satanic. Because if you add anything to the cross, what you're saying is the cross isn't enough. So re repent religiously is is terrible. Repent because you are saved. You're saved and you want to change your mind about some bad thinking. You do that because you are saved, not because you're trying to be saved. So in Colossians 3, I'll just read 1 and 2. It says, If then you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection, which is your thinking, on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And uh, verse 5, Mortify therefore the, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness. Change your mind about these things. Okay? And uh, which is idolatry. So, um, and then verse, uh, let's look at verse 8 through 10. But now, you also put off, put off, change your mind. Put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to an, one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on. This is these are mental attitude things. Okay, that's what we're talking about: repenting, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that is created, not emotional zeal. Okay. So that, that's, do we repent? Sure, we repent, but not the religious way. We repent doesn't mean sorrow for sins. It means change your mind. And so now, again, we don't want to add to the cross. Um, but in uh, Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 13, things have changed. And what they were, how they were, their salvation, salvation is a dispensational issue. It changes from one dispensation to the next. In chapter 13, verse 39, it's, it's important to recognize that because he says, and, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So for gospel salvation is for gospel salvation. It's true. That's what, what we're rightly dividing truth from truth. But things change now, and now it's just faith alone. So uh, let's look at um, Romans 3.21 real quick. Romans 3.21, the verse we're all familiar with here. Romans 3.21, this is important to, I'll get there someday. But now, to t on the timeline, the Bible's on its own natural timeline. In the four Gospels, they needed to know what time it was then on, their on that timeline. Today, we're in the age of grace, but now, indication of time, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. That's why I brought up er earlier that in the four Gospels, they are under the law because you can now you're going to have to contrast that with, but now the righteousness of God without the law. That's the law of Moses being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So there's a drastic change. Drop down to verse 27. Uh, Romans 3. 
27, he says, where is boasting then? If, if you're going to, if you're going to repent religiously, you have something to boast about. I got, I begged for forgiveness. I went to the priest, whatever. That's how I know I'm saved. Plus, Jesus died on the cross. That's, that, you have something to boast of. If you, if you have your hand in your own salvation, then you're boasting. Mm -hmm. But it says, it is excluded by what law? Of works, that would be Moses' law. Nay, but the law of faith, the principle of faith. Therefore, verse 28, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without deeds of the law. You don't want to add anything to the cross because that would be boastful works. Um, okay, Romans 4, 4, Romans 4, 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. You're trying to say God owes me because I did, I did something. I did what the priest told me to do. Okay, verse, uh, uh, verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justified the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. That's, uh, okay, can't be much clearer than that. Um, Romans 11, verse 5. Even so, then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. That's us. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. You don't want to. You don't want to add anything to the cross because that's a works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Okay. And um, that's it. So I'll just close with with uh, repenting. It's important to understand that yes, it, it's it is. It is necessary to change your mind, but that's what it means. It never has meant be sorrow for sin, be sorry for sin. Okay, and with that, I'll close in prayer because I forgot to open in prayer. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we had this morning to look into your word and get clarity on this uh, issue of, of repenting and the simplicity that, that's in it and how religion can just keep it from us if we allow it. We just thank you for your word and for for the salvation we have through Christ on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.